Number 10, Earth 5 Shazam. Earth 5, or Earth S, is a simpler, kinder world. A world that is more optimistic. A world where the heroes are seen as such with hardly any faults. Basically, this is the golden age of comics. Specifically, Fawcett comics. Here, Captain Marvel is the main superhero, which gives the world the name Thunderworld. He and his family, Captain Marvel Jr. and Mary Marvel, keep the world safe from everything from the Monster Society to aliens. I'm talking like Shazam is essentially taking the place of Superman as the premier superhero of Earth. This version of Shazam worked together alongside Superman and Overman to recruit the Superman of the universe. They all worked together, led by Captain Marvel, to defeat Ultraman and weaken Mandrak, who was killed by the Green Lanterns. Number 9, Red Sun Batman. The Batman appearing in one of the greatest Superman stories ever, Red Sun, is not some crazy powerful amalgamation of characters. In fact, I'd say he's considerably weaker than a number of alternate Batman, but he is still Batman. In this dystopian Earth 30, where Superman became a tool of Stalin and his Soviet Union, Batman has become the most wanted man in Russia. As an adult, he became a blight on the Soviets and terrorized them all for revenge on Pyotr Rozlov, the captain of the police who brought the demise of Bruce's parents. He became an idol for those who wanted to oppose Superman and his regime. Eventually, Rozlov turned on Superman and convinced Batman to take down Superman. So, he stole Wonder Woman and bound her with her own lasso and drew Superman into a trap where he thus bombarded the hero with simulated red sunlight. He forced the weakened Superman into a cellar to lock him away forever. But alas, Wonder Woman managed to destroy her lasso and remove the generator powering up the lamps, and unwilling to be locked up and lobotomized, Batman detonated a little boom boom that he'd implanted within his own small intestine. But before he passed away, Batman revealed to Superman the truth of Roslov's treachery and got his revenge in a really roundabout way. Number 8, Flashpoint Cyborg. When Barry Allen Flash goes back in time to try and save his mom, he royally messes with the timeline, pretty much changing the whole DC universe. In this newly created timeline, Cyborg is America's greatest hero in place of Superman, based out of Detroit. He's the guy, but obviously he doesn't inspire the same kind of confidence as the Man of Steel because that would just be preposterous. When the Amazons and the Atlanteans go to war, Cyborg tries to gather a group of Earth's superhumans to help stop the conflict in its tracks, but it has already ravaged half of Europe. Thanks to Thomas Wayne, this timeline's Batman, refusing to join up, nobody else wants to join this group either. But then, superstar Barry Allen shows up and convinces Wayne otherwise, and the three set off to gather together an army of heroes, and they do, and it's awesome. Number seven, Dead Earth. Now, I'm not sure where the general consensus on this comic is, and quite frankly, I don't really care because I think this version of Diana of Themyscira is just absolutely insanely awesome. The comic picks up in an apocalyptic wasteland in what used to be Gotham City. Deep down in the remnants of what used to be the Batcave, Wonder Woman had been kept alive in a containment unit and was awoken by a group of humans who were running from a mutated monster known as a Hydra. After saving the humans and liberating their city, she journeys to Themyscira only to find out that the Hydra, or Hydra, are actually her her fellow Amazons mutated by atomic radiation after the Amazons had decided to go to war with the rest of humanity who had driven the Earth to its breaking point. The world had bombarded Themyscira with nuclear fire, even though Diana used the absolute limits of her abilities to try and stop that. When Superman, who fought for humanity, turned up to try and explain why he couldn't have helped Wonder Woman, we see just how powerful this Wonder Woman is. Losing complete control of herself, Wonder Woman and Superman fought each other to the point of causing a great fire that plunged the world into the apocalypse. And at the end of that fight, Wonder Woman, who was double fisting some kryptonite, brought Superman to his final rest with a hole straight through his chest. She collapsed from exhaustion and forgot everything. So when she learned of this past, Wonder Woman decided to set things right and protected what was left of humanity from what she once called her sisters. Number six, Injustice Superman. The Superman of the Injustice universe has pretty much the same history as the baseline Superman. 
But when the Joker kidnaps the pregnant Lois Lane, it lures Superman into a trap of fear gas. In this fear-induced state, Superman hallucinates that his wife is the villain Doomsday and instantly attacks her, flying Lois and what would have been John Kent into space, taking both their lives and also inadvertently causing a nuclear detonation to destroy his city, Metropolis. After losing his city, his wife, and his baby, Superman goes into a pretty understandable rage, bursting into the interrogation room where Batman is learning the true intentions of the Joker, and he just plunges his super fist straight through that clown's chest. Following these events, Superman takes control of the entire Earth and rules it as a tyrant. He turns on and destroys his friends, is manipulated by Wonder Woman, of all people, holds nothing back, and puts the entire Earth under the control of his regime. He is a seriously hardcore version of Superman, who has actually been revisited recently in John Kent's comic book story, where he even took the life of Earth 3's Ultraman very easily. It was kinda nuts. Now you may be wondering, how is this guy better than the original? He's not really. It's not the character himself that's better, it's more like the entire story as a whole is just really interesting and compelling, making it awesome to learn more and more about this evil version of Superman. Halfway through in a number five, Red Sun. Imagine, if you will, Batman being a force for Mother Russia. The Batman of this story was born to a pair of dissidents who were later killed by Stalin's police force. He vowed to seek vengeance against Pyotr Roslov, the captain of the police force. After 20 years, he became the most wanted man in the Soviet Union and continuously challenged the authorities, executing acts of terror against Superman's regime and evading Rosolov's police force skillfully. I couldn't help it. The, just that, that name kind of makes you have to go into that accent. The people revered him as a legend, impossible to kill and the ghost of killed dissidents. Rosolov convinced Batman to team up with him and eliminate Superman arguing that with Superman out of the way, Batman's vendetta against Roslov would be easier. Batman agreed and kidnapped Wonder Woman, using her lasso to draw Superman into a wasteland where he bombarded him with simulated red sunlight, and Batman intended to lock Superman away in a cellar, but Wonder Woman destroyed her lasso and the generator powering the lamps, which freed Superman. Batman then um, offed himself by detonating a bomb that was inside of his body to avoid being lobotomized and locked up, because of course that's gonna happen. In four Batman the Merciless. When Ares, the Greek god of war, created a helmet that amplified his powers a hundredfold, war broke out in an effort to stop him. For two years, Batman and Wonder Woman fought side by side to get close enough to attempt to stop the god. It was during this war that Bruce and Diana fell in love with each other. They and their allies made a pledge to kill the god of war in order to end his reign of terror once and for all, and as they finally mounted an attack to kill Ares, the two were able to get the helmet off the god of war. However, Diana was incapacitated, causing Batman to believe that she had died. Driven by grief, Bruce put on the helmet of the God of War to defeat Ares, despite being warned of its corrupting influence by Diana earlier on. Believing he could wield it mercifully, while making war fair and just, he succeeded in killing Ares, but was turned into a merciless warrior himself, who started to see his old code as worthless. Despite learning that Diana had actually survived and was only stunned by Ares, Bruce was too addicted to the power of the helmet to let it go. He, in fact, chose to kill the woman he loved rather than risk losing the helmet. And then, with virtually unlimited power and no sense of morality, Bruce went on to wage war on the entire world. Because, you know, gotta love angry Batman. This is basically just uh, Injustice Superman, but Batman. Getting close to the end in at number three, Red Death. Red Death is a villainous amalgamation of Batman and the Flash. Possessing super speed and a bloodlust like no other, his origin on Earth-52 negative is a dark one. Batman started off fighting crime with Robin, obviously, but Robin's kept dying. Robin after Robin, none would survive. So Batman grew increasingly extreme within his methods and basically lost all sense of morality. This led him to then seek out Barry, the Flash, for his speed force powers. However, when Barry refused to comply, Batman used weapons from his various enemies to in incapacitate Barry. Batman then rigged up a cosmic treadmill to his Batmobile somehow. I don't know how a treadmill is going to help power a car, but then he attacked 
attached Barry to the hood and drove them both into the Speed Force, causing a fusion of the two. The resulting entity was an evil Batman with super speed and a lust for death, while Barry's consciousness was trapped inside of Bruce's body. Oh boy. Red Death was later approached by the Batman Who Laughs and convinced to join Barbados's Dark Knights, whose aim was to conquer the multiverse, because of course it is. The logistics of how this came to be are unclear, but it's still freaking terrifying. I don't know how a treadmill makes the Batmobile able to get into the speed force, but you know what? 88 miles an hour, Marty. Let's go. Penultimately, in at number two, Batman Beyond. Amanda Waller, director of Project Cadmus, needed a new Batman to continue to fight for justice and saw genetic engineering as the solution. She created Project Batman Beyond by using Bruce Wayne's DNA to rewrite a male human's reproductive material and found a couple in Gotham City with a psychological profile nearly identical to that of Bruce's parents, the McGinnises. More Guinness was secretly injected with a nanotech solution that rewrote his DNA to basically be Bruce's, and then a year later, Terry was born with half of his mother's genetic material and half of Bruce's. To complete Terry's origins to become a crime fighter, Amanda planned to have the same trauma that inspired Bruce to become Batman happen to Terry's parents. Yes, this woman plotted to have a kid's parents assassinated right in front of him. After a night at the theater watching the gray ghost strikes, Amanda had had the Phantasm go over to kill Terry's parents. However, Phantasm refused to go along with the plan and allowed the McGinnises to continue on unaware of what might have happened that night. Uh, Terry still became the new Batman fighting for justice in a futuristic Gotham City, but still, come on, Amanda. I mean, like, I know you're Amanda Waller, but like, still, come on, okay? But also, Batman Beyond is like iconic and everyone loves it. And finally, in at number one, The Batman Who Laughs. The story of Batman of Earth Negative 22 was not much different different from that of any other version of the Cape Crusader. When he was a boy, Bruce watched his parents get killed in an alleyway, vowing vengeance against crime. He trained for years and years to become a hero and then became Batman, fighting supervillains in Gotham. But everything went sideways for this Batman when the Joker stirred a killing spree across Gotham. The clown had discovered that he was dying from the same chemicals that had actually turned him into what he was and wanted to take everyone with him. He killed all of Batman's enemies, including Penguin, Catwoman, Killer Croc, and the ventriloquist, and the Joker also killed Commissioner Gordon, who accidentally sprung an acid trap on his notebook and melted his face off. After becoming a hospital and recreating the scene from Bruce's parents' death right in front of him multiple times, this Batman lost control and broke Joker's neck. Unbeknownst to Batman, though, the Joker exhaled a toxin that contaminated Bruce's heart, which infected anyone close to him if he had died. In this case, it was Batman. So this caused him to snap and basically become the new Joker before taking over Earth-22 and later on gaining cosmic power. So yeah, I'm gonna put that at number one. That's terrifying, but also dope. Number 10, we have Jason and Jenny Allen. Now, if you're not familiar with this pair of twins, don't fret too much because there is little information about them out there. However, their control over the emotional electromagnetic spectrum makes them incredibly interesting and that is why I included them on this list today. We get introduced to them in the Justice League Legacy storyline that takes place in an alternate future where the children of the Justice League fight off the darkness, a large mass of pure negativity that possesses the Justice League and causes the downfall of their world. As the kids of Barry Allen and Jessica Cruz, both Jason and Jenny possess green power rings making them the Green Lanterns of this timeline. However, what really sets them apart is their ability to create hard light constructs of different colors despite not possessing those power rings. With both possessing the potential to wield all the colors of the emotional spectrum, Jenny has shown the ability to create yellow, orange, and blue light constructs, and Jason has created red and blue light constructs as well, making them both some of the most adaptable lanterns out there. Now, if you want to check them out for yourself, they appear for the first time in 2017's Justice League Volume 3, number 26. Coming in at number 9, we have Green Lantern from Earth-9. Sometime after the death of the second Atom on Earth-9, we are introduced to a sudden wave of superhuman champions, and among them is the heroine known as the Green Lantern, or Lady of the Lantern. However, her origins are not really known, and there are actually three theories on who her secret identity is. The first says that she is the murdered archaeologist Lois Lane, and after her body was dumped in the Atlantic Ocean, she was found by mermaids or angels or something, and was revived and given the powers that she has now. The second states that a pair of twin sisters, one good and one evil, 
fought a battle over some mystical powers. The good sister won and placed the mystical power in the lantern, and then she dedicated herself to fighting forces that make others suffer. The third and final, and probably the most probable in my opinion, is that she is the sorceress Zaytana, who is sent on a mission by the dark circle of magicians to find the lantern. After many years, when she finally found it, she decided to keep it for herself, and well, the rest is kind of history. Either way, the mystery around her origins makes her all the more interesting, and man, I just really want to know more. Equipped with the green lantern, an old Chinese style lantern suspended from a hook, she possesses the ability to teleport, travel dimensions, and even resurrect the dead for a short period of time so they can carry out any unfinished business before fully passing on. Designed by Dan Jurgen with the intent of creating a unique and very, very old Green Lantern, why not check her out for yourself in 1997's Tangent Comics Green Lantern number one. Coming in at number 8, we have Jade. As the daughter of the original Green Lantern and his foe Thorn, Jennifer Lynn Hayden has the ability to harness the power of the Star Heart, which was the main power source of her father's powers. Making her first appearance back in 1983 in All-Star Squadron number 25, she briefly served as Earth 2's Green Lantern after she was given a power ring from Kyle Rayner when she briefly lost her powers. However, they were eventually restored to her during Rayner's brief tenure as the godlike being Ion. Like her father, she is capable of creating green hard-like objects thanks to the star mark on her palm, and she she can fly. However, what really sets her apart from other lanterns is that she has no need to recharge her powers thanks to her connection to the Star Heart. And she also shares powers with her mother as well. Thanks to these extra powers, she can manipulate plants at her will, and her skin actually contains chlorophyll, allowing her to use photosynthesis like a plant. She met an untimely death at the hands of Alexander Luther Jr., however, while trying to stop him from tearing the universe into a multiverse, but was eventually resurrected by the Black Lantern Corps during the Blackest Night, and you know, that kind of led to her being killed again by Kyle Rayner by blowing her head off. Check out her origins for yourself, and well, why not let me know what you think in the comments below. Number 7, Harold Jordan aka The Power Ring. Hailing from Earth 3, a universe where the morality of most heroes and villains are flipped, we have Harold Jordan, a feeble and cowardly man who worked as a janitor at Ferris Aircraft. Wielding the Ring of Volthum, a ring that feeds off his fear and panic instead of willpower, Harold was an incredibly powerful crime lord and a member of the crime syndicate. Giving him powers similar to all other lanterns, he had the ability to create hard light constructs, however, there was one major drawback that he realized during his time with the syndicate. He realized that although the ring was giving him the power he had always dreamed of, it was slowly killing him and he could never summon the courage or will to remove it himself thanks to his cowardice nature. During a fight with the Injustice League, Harold is finally freed from the ring, however, it did cost him his life as he had his arm ripped <laughs> lean off his body by Sinestro. Although he physically died, his consciousness was actually transferred to the Green Realm, a world made completely out of concentrated fear, and he still lives on to this day, holding on to the hope that his world can one day be saved. Making his first appearance in 2013's Justice League Volume 2 number 23 as part of the new 52 DC Universe, why not give his story a read for yourself? Number 6, Jessica Cruz. During the crime syndicate's rule on Prime Earth, Jessica Cruz is unwillingly and forcefully chosen to be the next and final wielder of the Ring of Volthum thanks to her PTSD and debilitating anxiety. Completely under the control of the ring, she was forced to attack her hometown, but thanks to Batman and the other Justice League and all their kind words, she was able to overcome the power of the ring and take control fully. Under the tutelage of Hal Jordan, she was fully taught how to control her ring and eventually mastered the use of it. Unfortunately, killed by the Black Racer during the events of the Dark Side War after jumping in the path of the Black Racer to save the Flash, she was freed from the Power Ring's control as it was completely destroyed alongside her. Impressed by her ability to overcome fear, she was then tracked down, resurrected, and given a Green Lantern ring, making her the Earth's newest Green Lantern alongside her soon-to-be crime-fighting partner, Simon Baz. Now, the two didn't always get along, however, after being forced to work together after Hal merged their power battery into one, the two did learn to accept each other's differences and work together after many close calls. Check out Jessica Cruz as Power Ring and the Green Lantern for yourself, starting with 2014's Justice League Volume 2, number 30. Number 5, Vampire Batman. In the Elseworlds Batman and Dracula trilogy, Batman goes up against vampires who have turned Gotham into their home, and then eventually he goes up against Dracula himself. In the first novel, Red Rain, the hero wipes out the vampires and Dracula, although he is transformed into a vampire himself, which means we get to see Batman take on crime using the powers of a vampire in the very next novel, Bloodstorm. He does his bestest to resist the darker aspects of being a vampire, but that all goes kaput when Batman lashes out and drains the Joker after the Joker de-lifed Catwoman. Now, Batman has Alfred and Gordon stake him, putting Batman into a catatonic state. A state that he was then revived from in the third book, Crimson Mist, when criminals took over Gotham in his absence. But he is almost completely animalistic now thanks to the isolation. A bloodthirsty vampire Batman quickly wipes out most of his enemies in a very brutal form, draining them in the process until he is finally put to rest by Alfred, Commissioner Gordon, 
Two-Face and Killer Croc, who all go with him to the grave. Number four, Strange Visitor Superman. Ah. Another Superman. I know, I know, but okay, before we start, technically, this Superman is not canon. But he is truly one of the more powerful versions of the character ever. In the story, Superman outlives everything in the universe, living for literally billions and billions and billions of years. He lives so long and gets so powerful that he gains new abilities like being able to split into thousands of copies that allow the hero to do what he does best throughout the universe at the same time. He outlives all the gods, cosmic entities, mortals, angels, demons, and everything. He watches countless civilizations rise and fall and learns an insane amount of skills like telepathy, which I didn't even know was a skill. He absorbs ridiculous amounts of energy, learns magic and strange sciences through all his copies, and then he reabsorbs them at the end of everything. He can fly faster than the entropic waves of the end of the universe and can manipulate the fabric of reality through sheer strength. Number three, Nightwing the New Order. In the year 2028, all out war between heroes and villains had broke out in the streets of Metropolis. There was countless lost lives lives and destruction caused by the conflict for days, but after Batman passed away in the conflict, Nightwing activated a device in the war-torn streets of Metropolis that shut off or dampened the superpowers of most of the world, believing it was the best cause of action to save humanity from the dangers of the superpowered population. After this, Dick Grayson began a relationship with Starfire and together they had a son named Jake. Now, As time went on, Starfire progressively fell out of love with Dick and resented his cause. One day, after Dick had been chosen to lead the New Crusaders division to hunt metahumans, Starfire left Dick without saying a word, forcing him to raise their son alone in Wayne Manor. Now it turns out, Jake, Nightwing's son, is a metahuman with superpowers and Nightwing now has to go against everything he previously stood for to save his son from the world that he created. Tell me that's not cool. It's cool. Number 2, Aurora of Themyscira. Comics seem to continuously supply us with things that we never thought we needed. In a moment not likely to ever happen again in the near future, the House of DC and the House of Marvel we're friends. They could talk. They could play nice. And to prove that, one of the most beloved moments came in the mid 1990s when these two companies joined forces for a crossover. This took place in the amalgamated world of Earth 9602. On this Earth, it was not Diana Prince who became Wonder Woman. Instead, a meta mutant child by the name of Aurora was rescued and raised as a princess by the Amazons by Queen Hippolyta alongside Diana Prince. The two fought alongside each other as they grew up, but when the time came to choose, who would be Wonder Woman? Aurora's natural ability to control and harness the forces of weather, plus her Amazonian training, allowed her to secure the victory. She went off to become one hell of a hero when she finally left the island to enter man's world. It's an interesting take on the character and you should definitely check it out. And finally, in at number one, Batman of Earth 32. Unexpected is probably how I would describe the Batman from Earth 32. Now the original Batman of this universe was Bruce Wayne, who also became a Green Lantern. and then flew off into space. When he left the Earth to serve in the Green Lantern Corps, it left the role of Batman open. And who would have guessed that of all the characters, Alexander Luthor would be the one to answer the call. First appearing in Lex Luthor Year of the Villain number 1 from November 2019, this Batman was partnered up with Super Martian, which is a cross between a Martian like Martian Manhunter and a Kryptonian like Superman. As you can imagine, they were a powerful combo. They took up a base of operations in what looked like the Bat Cave, but mixed with the Fortress of Solitude, and were assisted by Fred, their awesome robotic butler. Thanks to having the Martian as his partner, Lex Batman was well acquainted with telepathy, and while it caused him some pretty bad headaches, it was also instrumental in helping deal with the Prime Earth Lex Luthor when he inevitably showed up on this world. In at number 10, Creed Quinn. Also known as Hyena, this version of the Joker first appeared in Legends of the Dark Claw number 1. It was an amalgamation of Sabretooth and the Joker, while also having a name mixing of both Sabretooth, also known as Victor Creed, and Harley Quinn of course. The interesting thing with this version of the Joker is that it was a shared creation of DC Comics and Marvel Comics, which meant that they had the creative freedom to feature combinations of both DC and Marvel characters. The Hyena fights against his nemesis the Dark Claw aka Logan Wayne, which is just a composite of Batman and Marvel's Wolverine. Hyena, much like Wayne in this comic book, is a mutant with the ability to rapidly heal injuries. The two were both subjects of the Weapon X program, but the program was an attempt to create living weapons, but Hyena used his enhancements to become a psychopathic killer. Typical Joker. In at number 9, Bloodstorm. 
In the comic book Batman Bloodstorm, the Joker becomes the leader of a group of vampires after the death of their original leader, Dracula. Taking place on Earth-43, he successfully coordinates his efforts to take control of Gotham's major crime families. Later on, the vampire version of Batman would team up with a werewolf combo of Selina Kyle. Unfortunately, Selina Kyle is killed in the final battle by Joker's vampires, but what's worse is that her death causes Batman to succumb to his own lust for blood. This version of the Joker, in my opinion, not only has kept true to the original, but added a unique twist, making him much cooler. Following Batman fighting his lust for blood, he ultimately gives in, biting the Joker, and thus falling victim to his master plan. Now Batman is left tormented by the knowledge that the Joker won their long conflict by driving him to kill. So not only is he damned by Dracula's bite and the Joker's blood now in equal measure, but he also must finally surrender to his vampire side. Death of the Family Scott Snyder had bold ambitions on creating a new Joker, one that was more fitting for modern times. To do so, he took the classic structure of the Joker and just cranked it up to 11, and man oh man was it ever cool. In the Death of the Family comic book, he actually fooled Batman into thinking that he had skinned his friends and forced them to eat their own faces. Plus, while doing so, the Joker appeared wearing his own severed face as a mask. At the dinner table in the Batcave, the Joker had Batgirl, Nightwing, Red Robin, Red Hood, and Damian Wayne all tied up around the table, staring at their own severed faces on a dinner plate. It all turned out to be a cruel joke, but that did not take away from the psychological damage that had been done. Scott Snyder set out to create a terrifying modern take on this villain, and both in style and storyline, she accomplished that goal. Number five. Zoom. Making his first appearance in the Flash Secret Files Origins issue 3, Hunter Zolomon, aka Zoom, believed himself to be the true Flash. He was the main enemy of Wally West Flash, and he took his name and appearance from the original Reverse Flash. Now, it all began when he was injured in an attack from Gorilla Grodd. He was left paralyzed from the waist down, so he asked Wally West if he could, you know, use the cosmic treadmill and maybe go back in time and prevent that horrible life altering event to take place, you know, something like that. But it's not that easy. Wally said he couldn't do it because you can't risk the time stream. But Hunter was so desperate, he broke into the museum and tried to use the treadmill, but this resulted in an explosion that gave him super speed. Going, of course, by the name Zoom, he believed that Wally West declined to help out because he never experienced loss. He had no idea what he was talking about, I guess. So Hunter took it upon himself to take out Linda Park, Wally's wife. What a horrible way to teach a life lesson. And then in The Flash issue 200, Wally West uses his powers to freeze Zoom and make him repeat the worst day of his life over and over. That's honestly a pretty messed up thing to do, Wally. I mean, it's not very heroic, but you know, we get it. You kind of sound like a villain though. I mean, someone repeating the worst day of their life? Jesus, dude. Just ground them. Make them bored. Number four, Avery Ho. One of the leading members of the Justice League of China, Avery Ho's Flash made her first appearance in the Flash Volume 5, Issue 3. She got her powers through the Speed Force storm of Central City, and at first she didn't have much control over them at all. She would just constantly vibrate, which sounds like a headache. It sounds like a nightmare, not being able to stop vibrating. Oh my god. She was visited by Barry Allen, though, and he taught her how to control that vibrating problem. And then later on, she was brought to Dewan Speed Force Academy to learn even more. When an unknown speedster was killing the current speedsters, Avery was able to warn Barry, and in the end, she was one of the lucky ones who got to retain her powers while dealing with Godspeed, who I'll explain later on. Number three, Black Flash. Making its haunting first appearance in The Flash Volume 2, Issue 138, The Black Flash was said to be seen right before the deaths of Barry Allen and Johnny Quick. Max Mercury had a close call with death, so he too saw it. It's literally the personification of death, and at first it came for Wally West, but instead it took his girlfriend Linda Park into the Speed Force. When it later returned, Wally had backup this time. The only ones that could help were the ones connected to the Speed Force, like Jay Garrick, Max Mercury, Jesse Quick, so on, and Danforth. They all joined the battle. And finally, Wally was able to defeat the Black Flash. Wally raced it to the end of time to do so. He raced it to a place where death had no meaning, so in turn, it just dissipated. Now the title Black Flash was also used when Professor Zoom was in his Black Lantern form. Little fun fact. Number two, Red Death. An evil fusion of Batman and the Flash. Say no more. Batman was the hero of Gotham City. He had his Robins, the usual story, but slowly as his sidekicks were biting the bullet, Bruce Wayne wanted more power to prevent the next one from happening. But he felt like still he wasn't fast enough. He felt like if he had the Flash's power, he could have done a better job. So he tried, he took out every Flash villain, he took all their weapons, and he used it to fight Barry Allen. Batman used his Batmobile and merged it with the cosmic treadmill, absorbing his powers, and then the Red Death was born. Now at this point, Batman, sorry, the Red Death was totally fine with killing. And even worse, he was okay with Barry's consciousness living inside of him, telling him to stop. 
Man, I thought having a song stuck in your head was bad. Imagine Barry Allen, It'd be a nightmare. And finally, number one, Future Flash. The Flash from the Out of Time storyline made his first appearance, well, last appearance, I guess, in the Flash Volume 4, Issue 30. Now we're talking 20 years into the future, and at this point, Barry witnessed the death of Wally West, and he felt guilt. He used his powers to go back in time and kill every enemy that was somehow involved in the path leading there. He does this, but eventually he comes into contact with himself, present day Barry Allen. And then Wally also shows up to stop this dark future Barry, so it's a, one of those weird ones. It's one of those storylines where Future Flash was actually always responsible for the death of Wally 20 years later. You can't change fate, no matter how fast you can run. Number 10, Jim Gordon. Jim Gordon ended up being recruited as a new Batman after the fallout of Endgame in the comics. Jim wasn't really in a great place to be commissioner as he had just recovered from the effects of Joker Venom, which had left him unhinged and violent, initially trying to kill his friend Batman. But at the same time, he was also still someone that the government and the police saw as being extremely useful. He had years of service under his belt, he knew Gotham like the back of his hand, and with Batman and Joker both believed to be dead, Gotham and its people were looking for a new man to take up the Batman mantle. Enter Jim Gordon. The government gave him training, muscle implants, and a new tech-based armor mech suit that also happened to have at least a semi-sentience. Jim named the suit Rookie and would both wear and work alongside it, in tandem with the police and government as a new, weirdly svelte Batman. That suit was tight. Of course, you could argue that Jim wasn't great as Batman, considering when Bruce returned, he kinda had some messes to clean up. But as a Batman who worked with the law and had a more intimate understanding of the justice system, it could also be argued that Gordon, in his own way, was better. Number 9, Azrael. Depending on your opinion of how best to deal with criminals, there are some who think Azrael did a bang up job as Batman and even would like to see him return to the mantle. Azrael ended up acting as Batman after Bruce Wayne had his back broken by Bane. Batman ends up leaving Jean Paul Valley in charge while he works on healing up and recovering. At first, Azrael seemed like a pretty good replacement, but he quickly gets wrapped up in his mission to bring criminals to justice. Azrael is considered to be more brutal and violent than Batman, going so far as to even kill criminals criminals who oppose him and not backing down when Bruce finally returns to take the Batman mantle back. Bruce even has to call in backup from his Robins to take down Azrael in the end. Well, Jean-Paul was definitely a different kind of Batman, he was a kind of different that some prefer. And friends, before we move on to our next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more seemingly impossible lists like this one, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Damian Wayne. And if you like supers who are not afraid to kill, do I have a Batman for you. Damian Wayne in the alternate future that is Earth 666 ends up becoming Batman after the current Batman, Dick Grayson, is killed by exploding Jokerfish. With Grayson dead, Damian believes that the only way to fight against crime is to go to extremes, believing that killing is the only way. Needless to say, this stance creates a lot more problems for Gotham, and especially for Commissioner Barbara Gordon, who becomes kind of a sworn enemy to Batman. In the end, Damien as Batman does bring about the destruction of Gotham and possibly the destruction of the world, but in a way, he was still super successful in what he set out to do. Damien created a bargain with the devil, trading his soul in exchange for becoming the eternal protector of Gotham, which is what happened. Of course, as with any wish or deal with the devil, there's always a twist. And in this case, the twist is that Gotham ends up being destroyed due to a nuclear strike. Still, Damien does protect Gotham till the very end of its existence. What more can you ask from Batman? Other than to, you know, I guess not let Gotham be destroyed, which is a fair ask, I suppose. Number 7, Elliot Ness. Elliot Ness becomes the Batman in the Elseworlds story Batman Scar the Bat from 1996. The reason why I think Elliot Ness makes a better Batman than Bruce Wayne? Well, because he's based on a real world character who actually fought to stop criminals in Chicago during the Prohibition era. He was a special agent who was known for taking down Al Capone with the help of his fellow law enforcement team, who were known as the Untouchables. In Scar of the Bat, we see Elliot Ness as a 1920s version of Batman, supposedly the one who inspired the character from the comics, Ooh, at least in this version of the story. When Elliot Ness finds he can't do enough within the limits of the law, he becomes a vigilante, taking up the mantle Batman because he fights crime sometimes with a bat. In turn, this weapon is chosen by Ness as Batman to scare criminals like Al Capone, who himself was known for beating those who betrayed him to death with a baseball bat. That, that's a scene that happens at the beginning of this comic. In the end, Elliot wins the day and hangs up the Batman mantle, allowing one of his colleagues who is on his deathbed to claim to have been Batman 
and so as not to besmirch Ness's name and ensure that the criminals get booked the proper way. Basically avoiding any hearsay because you know if you're a vigilante and you try to take someone for justice people won't be like but you're a criminal so it's all thrown out. One of those things. After recounting the truth to his biographer years later, Elliot Ness seemingly dies in his sleep due to a heart failure at his kitchen table. Which I believe is the actual way that Elliot Ness died in history. So yeah. I like stories where characters get to be heroes from history cause I like history. Number 6 Jace Fox aka Timothy Call Me Jace Fox, the son of Lucius Fox and Tanya Fox and brother to Tiffany, Tam and Luke Fox. This might be a hot take but I would argue that Jace was a better Batman because he chose to step up to the plate at a time when Bruce Wayne basically couldn't be Batman. So at that time period he was better since Bruce wasn't even Batman but was instead the dark detective having to operate well more in the dark due to being a super wanted criminal. However Jace saw the importance of the symbol of Batman and decided to take up the mantle in Bruce's place, despite the danger. He might not have as much experience as Batman, but he definitely comes with his own skill set and training backing him up. Jace's Batman in Future State also has access to future tech that current and past Bruce doesn't because future state. At number 5 we have the DCAU Superman from Batman Beyond. Only aging slightly leaving some grey in his hair, this version of Kal-El is actually turned evil by Starro the Conqueror who influences his actions over time to fit his evil agenda. But before this is found out, Superman leads the Justice League Unlimited for a while into the future, even inviting Terry McGinnis aka Batman Beyond into the league. It's good he does this too because Batman becomes the one who frees Superman from Starro's grasp down the line. This version of Superman is a more experienced and stronger hero and although he's tricked by a villain into doing some evil deeds, this isn't a list ranking power or wit. This version of Superman is just one of the more well known and respected and I figured he at least had to go in the top 5. At number 4 is Jordan Elliott. This is one of my personal favorites of these future versions of Superman because it's a rare example of a future Kal-El hanging up the mantle of Superman and actually living the existence of a mortal man. Which I think is a pretty cool glimpse into the character and how he would act if his life were simple and much less influential. His motivation to do this is that he actually ends up killing Mr. Muxia's put luck, which Thank goodness, so I don't have to say the guy's name anymore. Who he kills after the annoying little dude lays out a number of bad things to happen in Superman's life. In a fit of shame, Superman voluntarily walks into a room containing gold kryptonite which strips him of his powers permanently. He then takes on the name of Jordan Elliott after his father Jor-El and marries Lois Lane in anonymity. And honestly, I'm happy for the dude because we don't have to deal with that little mixiesta plick plick guy anymore, right? And also Superman's done enough. At number 3 is the Superman from the Dark Knight Returns storyline. One of the most iconic storylines involving both Superman and Batman takes place in a future where the government, aka Lex Luthor and Brainiac, has control over him. And they force Superman to carry out missions for them as a kind of superpowered contractor. A brainwashed superpowered contractor, that is. Seeing this from afar, Bruce Wayne decides he has to venture into the dangerous territory of mortal versus alien combat, taking on Superman 1v1. Luckily, Clark Kent comes back from his brainwashing, but only after a huge battle between the two former friends. At number two is the Superman from the Kingdom Come storyline. This iconic future version of Superman has to come out of retirement to protect the human race against a new misguided group of younger super beings. A more grizzled, aged and wise Superman, the Kingdom Come storyline brings a ton of humanity to the character as he faces the challenge of humbling himself and his allies in their older age. After a murderous superhero named Magog is acquitted of killing the Joker, Superman goes into hiding for 10 years leaving Kansas to be overrun by a community of misguided superpowered beings. Having also lost Lois Lane, Superman becomes jaded but ultimately comes out of hiding to reform the Justice League. On top of reforming a younger generation of misguided heroes though and well a brainwashed Captain Marvel which adds a huge rut in the whole works, they have to also prevent the humans from dropping three massive nuclear bombs on Kansas which are also super powered to affect super powered beings more than they originally would. This version of Superman shows a side to the hero that we are not used to giving him a wiser more jaded disposition. It really proves that doing the right thing is just in Kal-El's blood no matter how much the world has betrayed him. At number 1 is Superman Prime. 
This has got to be the most powerful and iconic futuristic version of Superman from the comics. And don't get this mixed up with Superboy Prime either, that's a whole other guy. Superman Prime appears in the DC 1 million series and sets out at the end of the 21st century to explore the cosmos. He then returns briefly in the 700th century, that's roughly 70,000 years later, and spends his time in his new fortress of solitude which is the sun. Finally, another 10 and a half thousand years later in the 853rd century, he comes back again, this time with a totally golden makeover and creates a new Lois Lane from scratch along with some other key players from his old life. This version of Superman is just completely overpowered and more of a god than many other iterations of the hero, giving us a glimpse into the vast expanse and possibility of a distant future for Superman. In a 10, Jim Gordon in the wake of Batman's apparent death against the Joker, plans for a new Batman were discussed. With Powers International laying the groundwork for a Batman inspired task force, their first candidate chosen to model the program was Jim Gordon, who was initially hesitant to fill Batman's shoes but eventually agreed. Going through intense government training and getting surgical muscle implants, Gordon was given the first model of the new Batman robot armor, which he nicknamed Rookie, and took to the streets as the new Batman. By complete change, he finds Bruce Wayne and informs him that he has taken up the reins as Batman. And as Gordon hears several different reports about Bruce Wayne being found dead throughout Gotham, he works with Batman to figure out that a Batman from an alternate dark universe, known as the Batman Who Laughs, is the one responsible. Tracking him down, Gordon seeks help from his estranged son, James Jr. However, another dark version of Batman arrives and introduces himself as the Grim Knight. But it's certainly jarring to see Batman go from like this like big bulky hero to to a lanky Jim Gordon. He looks fragile, but I mean still, it's kind of dope that, that Gordon becomes Batman. In at 9, Flashpoint. Thomas Wayne's Batman from the Flashpoint timeline is a fascinating and tragic character, and honestly, one of my favorite versions of Batman. In this alternate universe, it was Bruce Wayne who was killed in the alleyway, causing his father, Thomas, to become Batman instead. Unlike his son's more traditional superhero version, Thomas Wayne's Batman operates more like a vigilante using brutal and even lethal tactics to take down his enemies. He's a hardened and embittered figure who has given up hope for justice in a world riddled with corruption and violence. And I mean, given his origin, I kind of get it. I understand why. Despite his brutal methods though, Thomas is driven by a deep sense of love and protection for his wife Martha, who has gone insane and actually become the Joker in this reality after the loss of their son. He'll stop at nothing to try and save her, even if it means crossing moral boundaries. Boundaries. Thomas Wayne's Batman is a dark and tragic twist on the traditional Batman mythology, and he reminds us that the choices we make, even the ones made with the best intentions, can have unforeseen and devastating consequences. But also, he killed Reverse Flash, which is pretty dope. In it, a red rain. Batman investigates a series of gruesome murders in Gotham City, only to discover that the killer is none other than Dracula, the legendary vampire. Batman teams up with a rogue vampire named Tanya to stop Dracula and his brood from terrorizing the city. But in the course of it, Batman actually l makes Tanya turn him. Yeah, he becomes a vampire to fight the vampires. Tanya then provides Batman with a blood substitute to spare him from the cycle of death and murder that comes with being bitten by a vampire. But in order to destroy Dracula's minions, Batman lures them into the Batcave, where Tanya and her followers engage them in combat. Batman detonates multiple explosives, destroying Wayne Manor and exposing the cave to sunlight, which ultimately kills all the vampires inside it. Batman then confronts Dracula himself and impales the vampire lord on a tree that had been struck by lightning. This act, however, comes at the cost of Batman's humanity as Dracula drained the last of his blood. Nevertheless, Batman assured Alfred that he has nothing to fear, as the Batman, with his new literally vampiric powers, will live on forever. The most Batman Batman version on this list, if I'm honest. In its seven, Gotham by Gaslight. Gotham by Gaslight is about 19th century Bruce Wayne recalling the killing of his parents as a child. Consulting with Dr. Sigmund Freud, yes that one, about the dreams he has had about the deaths of his parents and significantly bats, he then returns to Gotham City to become Batman and fight crime. The Gotham press begins to circulate the news of the Batman and soon links his appearance to a series of women found killed throughout the city. The identity of the killer is announced by Commissioner Tolliver, 
to be Jack the Ripper. Eventually, Bruce is accused of the murders and sentenced to be hanged, and is imprisoned at Arkham Asylum. But with the help of Alfred, he escapes, dons the bad suit, and stops Jack the Ripper, who is revealed to be Jacob Packer. Jacob then also confesses to causing the deaths of Thomas and Martha, and framing Bruce in revenge for Martha's rejection. The comic was a one-shot from January of 1990, but became a fan favorite, and is quite the interesting and dark tale, because Batman fighting Jack the Ripper? That's kinda dope. In its six, Dark Claw. Logan Wayne is a combination of obviously Bruce Wayne and Logan, being first introduced in Marvel vs. DC number 3. At 5 years old, after witnessing his parents killing at the hands of an armed robber, Logan Wayne was sent to live with his uncle in Alberta, Canada. His uncle was a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and was ambushed and murdered by poachers a short time after his arrival in Canada. After the death of his uncle, Logan then went to live in a home run by nuns, and as soon as he was old enough, he enlisted in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Logan was submitted to the Weapon X Project, the Canadian Super Soldier program, and it was here where Logan had adamantium bonded to his bones and learned of his metamutant nature. The Weapon X project was terminated due to its dual failure. Logan was ineffective as a weapon because he possessed a conscience, but this didn't stop him from being pretty damn badass. Having all the powers of Logan, as well as things like the Clawcopter and the Clawmobile, I'm not even kidding, those are actually things, this is ins this is essentially a super-powered Batman, and I think that that's something we all, we all wanted. Plus, Dark Claw? That's a great freaking name, dude. That's dope. That's terrifying. Number five, Martian Manhunter. Look, I think it's incredibly easy to overlook Martian Manhunter's incredible capabilities. Yes, he is more well known for being a telepath and a shapeshifter, but this guy packs a hell of a punch with the Martian abilities of phasing, Martian vision, and density alteration. In DC 1 million, we get a version of John Johns, or John Jones, who leads a war against Darkseid and gets him to surrender to the source wall, becoming trapped inside of it. The source wall, in return, gave John one wish. His wish was to become one with Mars, meaning John became a living planet while maintaining his multiversal telepathy and his genius level intelligence. Now we don't get to see much of this version of John, but we can guess a lot of things about this version. Firstly, his weakness to fire is probably non-existent because I mean, People gotta make fire on a planet, I guess. We can also probably assume John keeps his other Martians' abilities to a degree, and there's also the possibility that the passage of time has increased those natural abilities considering he's defeated Darkseid. We can also assume that he would now also have the powers that usually come with being a living planet, like weather manipulation and control of the elements, and he can control the sands of Mars to an incredible degree, so there's that too. Number four, last night on Earth, Joker. In Batman Last Night on Earth by Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo, Batman, or rather a clone of Batman created by Batman's own resurrection machine, goes out into a post-apocalyptic world completely rocked thanks to Lex Luthor. One of the first things that this new Batman finds, funnily enough, is a lantern with the head of the Joker somehow still alive and speaking inside of it. Kind of like in God of War when Kratos gets the head of Mimir that he just carries around on his hip. Batman takes this Joker lantern as a companion, and this talkative Joker keeps the Dark Knight company as he works to find a way to dethrone Omega, who is a villain that rules over the apocalyptic world using Darkseid's Omega effect. This Joker is strangely friendly and compassionate, and he is honestly a great cheerleader for Batman, which I don't think any of us expected to see. What we really didn't expect to see is that this disembodied head is given a robotic body to become Batman's new Robin. What? Number three, Kingdom Come Shazam. In an alternate possible future, metahumans or superheroes are now Hated. Because of this, Billy Batson hasn't become Shazam in years and is now a full grown man looking a lot like his alter ego, minus the cool costume and cape and powers and, and all that stuff. He was eventually brainwashed by Lex Luthor into believing that metahumans and even Captain Marvel, who lives inside of him, sort of, are all monsters. In time, Bruce Wayne tries to convince Billy otherwise, which eventually forces him to turn to Shazam once more, breaking open the metahuman prison and starting a massive massive war that puts the world at risk. Now after a nuclear device was dropped threatening to take out thousands of people, Superman convinced Billy to help and Shazam outraced Superman to the device using his lightning to destroy it and sacrificing himself to save both humans 
and metahumans, ending the hatred against superheroes once and for all in this world. Number two, Bat Prince. Another alternate version of Batman, I know, but he belongs to probably one of my favorite alternate reality stories to come out of DC Comics, Dark Knights of Steel. This story takes place in a world of medieval fantasy where the Wayne family ruled their kingdom until the mother and father of Superman came to Earth. The L family house became rulers of the land after a horrible attack on the Wayne family. Now, as the surviving son of the Waynes, Bruce serves as both a knight and an adopted son to the L family, with his network of Robins and his super brilliant mind. But as the world is at each other's throats, this Bat Prince learns about the actions that led to his birth and the powers he now possesses as a half Kryptonian Dark Knight. Dark Knights of Steel that came out last year in 2022 just has so many interesting and fresh takes on classic DC characters. It's fresh and fun and flirty, and I got a variant cover of the first issue and it looks so sweet, and maybe one day I'll get to show you guys. Definitely read Dark Knights of Steel. And finally, into number one, it's Green Lantern Earth One. This Green Lantern focused story is one that I actually really, really like. It brushes over a lot of things very easily, but it made me care about the Green Lanterns, and that's something Thing I didn't think was ever gonna happen. Sorry. It almost feels like a dark sci-fi take on Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns. Essentially, in this story, Hal Jordan is on the moon with a crew of workers who mine for metal when he comes across a crashed alien ship containing the Green Lantern ring, a Green Lantern battery, the corpse of Abin Sur, and a robot called a Manhunter. Hal claimed the ring just taking it off of the alien corpse and use it to fight the Manhunter that sprung on him. What had happened is that the Manhunter robots were created by the Guardians of the Universe to take out the Green Lanterns as the Lanterns had grown uncontrollable and they were pretty successful, but also grew out of control, putting the galaxy in peril and leaving the Green Lantern core broken and spread extremely thin. Hal meets up with an equally inexperienced Kilowag and they go across the universe trying to rally together any Green Lanterns they can. It all feels like the best way I saw it described was as if Christopher Nolan and Ridley Scott teamed up and made a Green Lantern story. It does feel like that, and it's just such a cool and fresh take. Number 10, Calvin Ellis. Instead of Cal L landing on a farm in Kansas, a black Kryptonian named Calvin Ellis was sent to Earth to escape his planet's destruction. Nevertheless, he didn't grow up trying to fit into society as he instead became very ambitious. What do I mean by that? Well, Calvin Ellis worked hard enough to eventually become the President of the United States, giving him a position that allowed him to better protect his world both politically and physically. He still carried his role as Superman and even became a multiversal hero when he teamed up with the other versions of the character during the Infinite Frontier era. Calvin Ellis gained political power as well as his own incredible Kryptonian abilities, not to mention that he reprogrammed the alien intelligence Brainiac to help him in his duties. He's also a talented boxer. So there's that as well. Number nine, Eradicator Lois. For this point, we are going to go back in time to the infamous death of Superman. When Superman fell in the fight between himself and Doomsday, it didn't hit anyone as hard as it hit Lois Lane. In the dark multiverse, however, something curious happened. After some time passed and Lois saw the effects of a Superman-less world, she eventually traveled to the Fortress of Solitude to return Superman's cape. What she didn't expect to happen was for the Kryptonian Eradicator to show up. This defender of Krypton is the reason that Superman does eventually come back, placing Clark in the Kryptonian life matrix that was supposed to revive Superman. In this story though, it takes longer than expected. Assuming that the revival was a failure, the Eradicator instead places the powers of Superman into the body of Lois Lane. Unfortunately, this is the dark multiverse though, and so this newly superpowered Lois Lane throws almost all caution to the wayside and uses her powers recklessly, saving the day, but with no regard for collateral damage or repercussions. She ends wars, feeds the hungry, destroys the military industrial complex, all that good stuff, but she also wipes out countless lives, including Batman's, Lex Luthor's, and she's even responsible for the fall of Superman again when he finally does return. The whole story is tragic, but it's also really, really cool and to maybe check out part one to make sure I didn't miss any of your favorite alternate DC Universe superheroes. Number eight, 
Batman Who Laughs. While the Batman Who Laughs was Bruce Wayne from Earth Negative 22 of the Dark Multiverse, he basically becomes the most powerful alternate version of the Joker and Batman ever. Everything about this Batman remained relatively the same until the day the Joker found out he was going to pass away. And so, he decided to take everyone with him. Joker took down a large number of Batman's rogues gallery, including Catwoman. He caused the passing of Commissioner Gordon, and he paralyzed Batman, forcing the Dark Knight to watch as the Joker took the lives of countless innocent people. Once Batman regained his movement though, he lost it and put the Joker to rest. Now as his one last sick joke, a toxin in the Joker's heart escaped his body, infecting Batman and turning him into the most terrifying Joker-Batman hybrid you have ever seen. With all the intelligence and physical ability of Batman mixed with the insanity and psychosis of the Joker, the Batman who laughs is off the chain. He has a book on how to destroy the multiverse as well as a real world comic book that lays out the structure of the universe. He has a pack of metal cards that can warp reality, he has a pack of feral jokerized robins, and he can corrupt people to his side with his joker toxin, like Shazam as an example. He wiped out all the heroes of his universe and several others and put together a squad of evil Batman who he used to become one of the biggest threats in the multiverse, almost bringing the end of everything. He's not better, but he's cool. Number 7, Furnace. Before the Martians became the Martians, they were an incredibly violent and powerful race called the Burning. The Guardians of the Universe experimented on the Burning and put genetic blocks in place to make them afraid of the fire that they used as their most powerful weapon. That's why Martian Manhunter has a fear of fire. Now after the Justice League was trapped and taken down in Obsidian Age Atlantis, John Johns or John Jones blamed himself for his friend's passing because his fear of fire completely overtook him. So, he recruits Scorch to help him overcome his fear, and he would use his telepathy to help her deal with her own problems. Now unfortunately, in doing this, he also broke the genetic blocks, allowing John to become the incredibly dangerous Furnace. With all of his original powers boosted in potential, especially his telepathy, plus an insane level of pyrokinesis. Number 6, All-Star Superman. All-Star Superman is actually a 12 issue series that sets itself apart from the rest of the DC Universe by sort of being a standalone story. At the beginning of the tale, Superman saves an exploration mission to the sun that was sabotaged by Lex Luthor. But because of his exposure, but because of his overexposure to the yellow sun, he ends up developing new abilities such as the power to harness the bioelectric aura and pushing his normal abilities to unimaginable levels. But it wasn't just his powers that got a boost. His intellect, creativity, imagination, and curiosity also got boosted up to the point that he started getting new skills and trying out new experiments, even some that would allow a successor for himself to be created. That's important because while his abilities and mental acuity had been boosted up and he even became immune to green kryptonite, the overexposure to the sun also meant he was starting to slowly pass away as his cells became overloaded, causing this story to get really, really damn emotional. Coming in at number 5, we have Simon Baz. Mentioned briefly just a little bit ago, let's talk about the former street racer and car thief turned Green Lantern. After the horrible event that occurred at the World Trade Center, Simon and his family found themselves under extreme suspicion due to the color of their skin, leading him to be, you know, bullied for most of his life. Despite these hardships, Simon was able to finish all of his schooling and eventually became an engineer. However, he was fired thanks to a financial crisis and desperate for money, he turned to the streets and started street racing. One night, he accidentally stole a van full of explosives and a high-speed chase ensued, ending in his arrest due to him being a suspected member in an unrelated attack. Back. Even though Simon pleaded he was innocent, everything he said was ignored, but his will was strong enough to summon a Green Lantern ring, albeit, you know, a defective one, to help him break out of jail. Now possessing the powers of the Green Lantern, Simon was able to track down the true owner of the van and bring him to justice with the help of Agent Fed. Now as I mentioned earlier, Simon eventually teams up with Jessica Cruz to help keep the Earth safe from any danger that comes his way. But one thing that really sets Simon apart from the other Lanterns is he actually possesses two incredibly rare abilities that few Green Lanterns have. One being Emerald Sight, which allows him to see glimpses of the near future, allowing him to prepare for anything that comes his way, and the other being the ability to heal others through sheer willpower. Something that was, you know, thought to be completely impossible until right then. First appearing in 2012's The New 52, FCDB Special Edition Number 1. Give his story a read for yourself. I'm sure you'll all really like it. Number 4, Guy Gardner. 
From the Prime Earth Universe, we're going to be talking about Guy Gardner, the colorblind, ring-swapping Green Lantern of Sector 2814. Estranged from his father and, you know, most of his family after resigning from the Baltimore Police Department, it's needless to say that Gardner has some underlying daddy issues that he will probably never address. After his brother was shot during a drug bust, Guy rushed him to the hospital in hopes of saving his life. However, he wasn't fast enough. But luckily for him, on his way, he was found by a Green Lantern ring thanks to his overwhelming ability to overcome great fear, and that allowed him to get his brother safely to the hospital. As the only Green Lantern on Earth at that time, Guy had a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. However, not everyone was on his side when it was revealed that the Guardians were secretly sabotaging him from behind the scenes. Gardner was eventually asked by Hal Jordan after the battle against the Third Army to go undercover and join the Red Lantern Corps. And in no time, he actually became their leader and changes almost everything for the better by keeping everyone and everything safe from Atrocitus and allowing the Red Lanterns to cause only justice-based murders. Later, he once again joins forces with the Green Lanterns to defeat Relic, and Guy and the Red Lanterns are giving Guardians over Sector 2814 alongside Simon Baz. Check out his new 52 appearance in 2011's Green Lantern Corps Volume 3 Number 1, or if you want to see him in his very first appearance, take a look at 1968's Green Lantern Volume 2 Number 59. Number 3, Kyle Rayner. Another Prime Earth inhabitant, Kyle Rayner is the fourth human Green Lantern and one of the most powerful to ever exist, having also been a White Lantern and a host of Parallax and Ion. In addition to his green power ring, Rayner was actually chosen to wield the other six rings of the emotional electromagnetic spectrum, making him the hybrid lantern for quite some time, before he was overwhelmed by the sheer power and all his rings, aside from his green and orange ones, were destroyed. During the rise of the Third Army, we see Kyle prepare for a fight with the Guardians of the Universe, and he sets out to master the powers of all the other rings, beginning with the Red of Rage. Later during the events of Lights Out, we see him wield the sheer power of the white light to protect himself against the Relic. However, this did cause the release of the Relic. After an insane journey and a battle with Relic alongside the other lanterns of every single color, Raider is able to pull the beast through the source wall, causing them to both disappear, until it was confirmed that Relic transformed into a part of the wall. Thought to be dead, the other lanterns returned to their homes, but the Guardians stuck around to see Kyle emerge from the wall, and after learning how, you know, it all works and where their energy supply comes from, the Guardians decide that the information he knows is much too vital and that Kyle's survival has to be kept a secret. Now, obviously there is so much more to Kyle Rayner's story seeing that he made his first appearance back in 1994's Green Lantern Volume 3 number 48, so I highly recommend you read it for yourself. Or maybe start with his new 52 appearance in 2011's Green Lantern, New Guardians number 1 if you're you know, looking for a more recent storyline. Number 2, Jon Stewart. Following in the footsteps of his predecessor Guy Gardner, Jon Stewart decided to forego a secret identity as the third Green Lantern of Earth. Once an architect, Jon was selected by the Guardians of the Universe as Hal Jordan's backup after Guy Gardner was seriously injured. Since his first appearance all the way back in 1971's Green Lantern Volume 2 number 87, we've seen John team up with some of the most powerful beings in the universe, including the Justice League, Dark Stars, Indigo Tribe, and even the United States Marine Corps. Although Hal was unsure if John was fit to be a Lantern at first because of his attitude toward authority figures, he has since proven himself time and time again to be worthy of the name Green Lantern, having played a massive role in the Sinestro Corps Wars, the War of Light, the Blackest Night, and the War of the Green Lanterns. How However, he has had to do some things that have made him doubt his will, the biggest being the times he's had to destroy not one, but two worlds for the greater good. Now, if you're not familiar with Jon Stewart as the Green Lantern, I highly recommend you check out his story for yourself. He was actually the first Green Lantern I had ever heard of, so he does hold a very special place in my heart. And finally, number one, we have Hal Jordan. Definitely the most well-known version of the Green Lantern and the most deserving of the number one spot in my eyes. Hal Jordan is the first human to ever become a member of the Green Lantern Corps and has been regarded on multiple occasions as the greatest greatest Green Lantern of all time. For your sake, I won't go too deep into his backstory and all his accomplishments because we could be here for literal days, but I'll do my best to give you the highlights. Before becoming the Green Lantern, Hal was an Air Force pilot and was chosen by a Green Power Ring for his ability to overcome great fear, you know, like all the other Green Lanterns out there, which led him to becoming the Galactic Police Officer of Sector 2814. As one of the founding members of the Justice League, we've seen him take on the likes of pretty much every major villain in the DC Comics universe. One of Hal's most defining moments as a Lantern, and honestly one of my favorite moments in comic book history was during the Blackest Night, when Hal became the White Lantern. After Necron separates Sinestro from the Entity, Hal actually bonds with it and uses its power to transform the resurrected heroes into White Lanterns, dubbing them the White Lantern Corps, and they defeat Necron by reviving the Black Hand, severing Necron's link to the Living Plane. Basically, he became one of the most powerful beings in the universe and completely annihilated darkness itself. If you want to hear more about Hal Jordan, you know, his origins and all his adventures, please let me know in the comments below and maybe we'll dedicate an entire video to him. But in the meantime, why not Read all about him for yourself, starting with 1959 showcase number 22. Number 10, 
Jay Garrick. He made his first debut back in Flash Comics issue one. He was the first Flash, so we figured we gotta start with him. He rocks the blue pants and the red top with the lightning bolt. Classic, classic look. But the thing that stands out the most with Jay is probably his winged hat, Hermes helmet. He's got super speed and pinpoint accuracy with a helmet. He'll throw a helmet at your kneecaps if he can't catch you. This dude is a badass. He wasn't on a god level like some of these other versions that I'll mention, but he could run at the speed of sound, which back in the 40s, that was quite impressive. Jay went to Midwestern University in Keystone City, majoring in both chemistry and physics. But when an experiment to purify water went south, these fumes knocked him out for a whole week. During that beauty sleep, Jay's body rejected nutrients and his metabolism increased greatly. When he did finally wake up, his new powers got him a spot on the Justice Society of America while remaining a scientist. He's getting it done, heroic way and in the nerdy way. We love him. Number nine, Barry Allen. One of the most popular versions of The Flash, of course, has gotta be Barry Allen. He made his first appearance in Showcase issue four. When he was just a child, his mother was sadly killed and his father was convicted of the crime. Barry was so determined to prove his father's innocence, so he went to school at Sun City University, receiving a major in organic chemistry and a minor in criminology. As an adult, he moved to a central city apartment and began dating Iris West, a reporter from Pitcher News. An electrical storm hit one night when Barry was working on an experiment when a bolt of lightning hit him while shattering a cabinet full of chemicals. Now, this resulted in Barry being now the fastest man alive, and he tried to hail a taxi, but when he ran after it, he was much further than he intended on going. Pretty sweet discovery. He used his power to save Iris West from a stray bullet, and after that point, he knew he had to do more. The first villain Barry ever went toe to toe with, ironically, was the Turtle Man. Barry wasn't used to controlling these speeds yet, so he would just keep whizzing by him in random directions. It was actually pretty stressful. The Turtle Guy did not bad. Slowest guy on Earth versus the fastest guy on Earth. And somehow it came close. He was in a rowboat and he's like, you can't catch me, Barry. He's like, I can't. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be awesome. It helps us out so much here on the channel. You guys are the best. Now let's get right back to this list. Number eight, Wally West. So after Barry Allen sacrificed his life in the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline back in 1985, it was Wally West who stepped up to take on the Flash mantle next. He popped up for the first time in the Flash issue 110. He was born in Blue Valley, Nebraska, and he grew up daydreaming about being the Flash one day. So when his Aunt Iris was dating Barry Allen, like the Flash that he dreamt of being, it was like a dream come true. It was like meeting your idol. He was in Barry's apartment and the chemical cabinet was the exact same as how when Barry got his powers. So Wally just had to ask about it. Well, it turns out the weather was also the exact same on this night because Wally wished that he would become the Flash and it happened. Lightning hit, creating another speedster. That's pretty encouraging. I'm just gonna go hang out near my medicine cabinet next time there's a storm. Just wait. Number seven, Leah Nelson. Earth 9's version of the Flash is one of the most powerful and Popular, <laughs> double whammy. She's actually the second most recognized person on the planet, despite traveling at blink and you'll miss it speeds. She made her first appearance in Tangent Comics Flash issue one back in 1997, created by Dan Jurgens, Todd DeGazzo, and Gary Frank. Now, Leah was famous since birth, not because of her whole abilities, but because her parents were the first astronauts to go on the Jupiter mission. Once Leah grew up and learned how to control these abilities, she took on the alias The Flash, but still wasn't sure if she was loved by the public because of her abilities or just because of who her parents are. Kind of like a Kardashian. She joined the Secret Six later on, but her main goal was to get rid of that world's Harvey Dent, aka Evil Superman. She even got Wally West to help join the fight in Tangent Superman Reign issue one. Leah is made of light, like literally, she could control and manipulate light. But perhaps one of the best features is that she's an amazing actor, like that would definitely come in handy. During Countdown Arena issue one, Leah pretended to be a damsel in distress to manipulate Jay Garrick of Earth 2. So many skills. I love it. Number six, Kingdom Come Flash. On our last list, we were breaking down 10 different versions of Superman. So if you haven't checked that out, do so after this video. It should be somewhere over there. But in it, of course, we mentioned the Kingdom Come storyline and the Flash of Earth-22, Wally West was the father of Kid Flash and a member of the Justice League. So after Superman had retired, he took his job into overdrive. He was sprinting crime scene to crime scene, just a constant force. You couldn't even have a conversation with the guy. He was that busy. Lots to do now that Supes is gone. I mean, more than fair. The Kingdom Come storyline is one of the most compelling for our characters, especially because the Flash couldn't stop. He didn't have a choice to retire. He had a daughter in this reality as well, named Kid Flash, so he was busy. Number five, Helena Wayne. 
While Helena Wayne might not even exist in the main continuity, at least not yet, although she's definitely been there before, that hasn't held her back from being one of the most extraordinary and capable Bat family members from the multiverse. On Earth 2, or one of the Earth 2s, because there's kind of two Earth 2s, Helena ends up taking up the mantle of her father, becoming the new Batman. She wears colors similar to Batwoman, red and black, but decides to keep the mantle as is, as opposed to changing it to match her own gender identity. Helena lives up to the name too, and while we don't get to see too much of her, in terms of her capability. Just knowing Helena Wayne from the comics and from both Earth 2s, I can imagine she would not only do her father proud, but also potentially end up surpassing him in terms of her capabilities. Having learned herself from the best. This version of Helena also trained under Bruce as his Robin and was there with him when he died, doing her best to defend her father before the building that he was in exploded. Number 4. Dick Grayson Dick Grayson was Batman's first Robin and would end up taking up the mantle of Batman after Bruce Wayne's supposed death at the hands of Darkseid. In reality, Batman wasn't dead but had simply kind of been blasted through time. Dick did such a good job with the mantle that even when Batman was revealed to have survived the events of Final Crisis and he returned, he actually didn't make Dick hang up the cape and cowl. Instead, in the one shot Batman the Return, Bruce asks Dick to stay on and operate as Batman in Gotham in his stead, while he heads out to manage Batman Incorporated, which was pretty cool. I feel like you know you did a good job as Batman when you get the stamp of approval from Bruce, which is definitely what Dick got as Batman and what Damien got working as Grayson's Robin. And you definitely are considered to be trusted when Bruce gives you Gotham to look after, which is definitely the city closest to his own heart. Number 3. Superman When Superman ended up swapping powers or lack thereof with Batman in 2003's Superman slash Batman, Superman proved to be the one who was better. Batman with Superman's powers ended up kinda losing his grip on reality. He believed that he could hear his parents' voices and became super violent in his fight for justice. The other heroes of Earth attempted to convince Batman to swap back his powers with Clark and let him help them, but he refused. In the end, it was up to Superman as Batman to stop him, which even without powers, he did. He ended up luring him back to Earth and employing the help of fellow colleague, friend, and hero Zatanna. While Zatanna is the one behind luring Batman to Earth with illusions of his parents and is the one who reverses the swap, in the end even Bruce admits that Superman did a great job as him, suggesting that the swap was about more than powers as Superman behaved and acted just as Bruce would have in his position, and did whatever it took, putting himself in danger to ensure the world was safe. Number 2. Batman 1 Million Batman 1 Million is of course from the future, way, way in the future. He hails from the alternate future known as DC 1 million, coming from year 85300. That's right, 85,300. What a year. There he guards the galaxy's most dangerous criminals who are held within a prison on Pluto. This Batman's identity is unknown to us, but we do know a bit of his backstory. He was one of the thousands of victims who was forced as a kid to watch the death of his parents at the hands of villain Zaron. While others were driven to madness or took their own life, this hero instead was inspired to make sure an act like this never happened again, taking up the mantle of Batman. Batman 1 million being from the future has a unique physiology which grants him superhuman abilities such as telepathy. He also has future tech, an off the charts IQ of over a thousand, not actually possible if you know how IQs work, and was one of the heroes who helped to save the earth from the traitor Starman and the plague that he had unleashed. Number 1. Terry McGinnis What would this list be without Terry McGinnis? As Batman's direct protege in the future, Terry definitely deserves our number 1 spot, I think. He also was designed to be the next Batman and so not only has the training and experience needed, learning from an older and wiser Bruce Wayne himself, but also genetically was made to become the best Batman possible. In fact, you could even argue because he grew up with his parents still alive that he might be a more whole Batman. Terry was the product of Project Batman Beyond, headed by Amanda Waller, who actually snuck Bruce Wayne's DNA into his conception with nanotech that would basically rewrite Terry's dad's genetic code to match Bruce's, making Terry in a weird way kind of Bruce's son slash half clone. Waller hired Phantasm aka Andrea Beaumont to then kill Terry's parents after they left the movie theater with their son, trying to also orchestrate the same origin story for Terry to help motivate him to become a hero. However, in the end Andrea refused to go through with it and so Terry got to live his life with his parents, alive. Although it should be noted his parents parents did end up getting divorced, giving Terry a different kind of struggle in life. Also, although his father wouldn't end up being assassinated by Beaumont at that time, he would later on die tragically. So still his tragedy in his past. He's a hero. All heroes I feel like have tragedy in their past at some point. At number 10 is Klitz, 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 Klitz Plick. Just put the name up on the screen please because I, I can't pronounce that. 
This guy, believe it or not, is actually a descendant of Cal L. This weird little dude hails from far in the future, around the 67th century to be more specific, but he is immortal, so he's also encountered as far into the future as the 853rd century. He is also known to be a fifth dimensional being, which means that he can explore dimensions beyond the understanding of any normal humans, including myself. I don't get it. And I'm not alone. Most heroes wouldn't even understand it either. He has all the classic Kryptonian powers, but due to his bloodline including genes from a whole other race of superpowered beings, this future version of Superman also has 5D vision, which means that he can share his thoughts with others in real time, among other things. And he uses a weapon called the Hyperpoon, which is a hilarious name for a weapon that functions beyond the means of our comprehension. It's basically just more 5D stuff. At number 9 is Super Batman. Not much is known about this guy other than that he was at one point part of the Superman squad. He is known as a mixture of two different heroic traditions, having descended from both the Superman and Batman families. Of course, he wears a uniform that marries the designs of both Batman and Superman costumes and seems to have a combination of the two heroes strengths as well. Sometime in the future this guy is formed and even though there's little known about him, I put him on the list because a hybrid of Superman and Batman must be pretty powerful to some crazy degree we would never understand. At number 8 is Superman Secundus. In the DC 1 million timeline, Superman Secundus is explained to be Superman Prime's direct heir, having founded the Superman dynasty and successfully fighting off the Tyrant's son as well as Solaris, among others. Then in All-Star Superman, another future Superman named Superman 2 appears, who seems to just be the same version of the hero as Superman Secundus, just in a different iteration. This future stuff gets a little bit complicated, but this future Superman seems pretty powerful and since he's known to be the son of Superman Prime, I felt I just needed to throw him on the list. At number 7 we've got Connor Kent, or FKA Superboy. This future version of Superman is pretty unique in that he's actually a clone of both Superman and Lex Luthor. He spends his youth in fear that he'll turn out more like Lex Luthor in all the worst ways, and unfortunately that's actually what happens. As Connor grows up into a more mature hero, he gains a reputation as a brutal version of Superman who uses extreme force against his enemies with little to no remorse. But later on during the Infinite Crisis storyline, we learn that this future Connor Kent is actually a clone of an early version of himself, which is a relief to him and but doesn't make much sense. Does it make sense? I don't know. Anyway, he's not Lex Luthor, at least. At number 6, we have Adam Ken plus 477 SPMN. The future is horrible at coming up with names apparently, but anyway, this future version of Superman is pretty cool because he kind of comes across as so futuristic that he's actually a much more complex being, but also a sort of simpler and stripped down being than Superman is now in a weird way, which is how it seems like the future would actually be if you went forward far enough. In Superman number 400 we see a future where Superman has died and his descendants have reproduced with humans, creating a new type of super being. But when they accidentally create a massive vortex in space, one of their leaders, Adam Ken, elects himself to plug it while the rest of them turn themselves into energy for some reason, to protect themselves. Anyway, the plan works and the vortex is mended, leaving only Adam can, we'll just call him Adam, leaving Adam as the only living being in the universe. So he thinks, until he meets his Eve.